people actually realize that there are so many people who die from gun violence every day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, by the count of the IENSA, or the International Action Network on Small Arms, there are 1,000 people who die from gun violence every day throughout the world. And in the Philippines, for example, my country, according to the Philippine Action Network on Small Arms, 24 people die on a daily basis because of gun violence. And it's because, really, there's what we call um, small arms and light weapons proliferation. Mm. The count right now is actually um, about 865 million small arms in the hands of people, mostly civilians. Mm. Um, and just a few um, percentage of this would be in the arms, in the hands of the security sector. So it's something really that should small be Small arms is what they call guns or firearms in the UN system. They're called small arms and light weapons. But basically we mean rifles, shotguns, pistols, handguns, Kalashnikovs, and also some other things like RPGs, but basically it's rifles, shotguns, and handguns. And so there are um, about um, 900 million of these weapons around the world. Many countries have not actually measured it, but uh, for example, some countries in Latin America have measured it. In, in El Salvador, um, armed violence, gun violence, takes up, absorbs 11% of that country's GDP is spent on the consequences of violence. So it's spent on, on, on health care for victims, it's spent on chasing criminals, it's spent on security, uh, trying to prevent, to protect against violence. And that is, in a, in a poor country, you can't afford to, set, to lose 11% of your economy because of gun violence. The abuse of these weapons impact negatively in our rural areas, suburban and urban regions, including our inner cities across the world. We lost men, women, teenagers, boys and girls, and children to the unmitigated actions of illicit trading, small arms and light weapons. Unfortunately, women and children, including young boys and girls, remain most victims of these violations. The challenges before us, therefore, are enormous and they remain daunting but they surely are not insurmountable. It is Zambia's hope that as we combat the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons in all its aspects, the issue of ammunition will also be considered as the small arms and light weapons um, only become functional with input of ammunition. I wish to reiterate Zambia's commitment to the United Nations Program of Action and the ITI implementation. It is Zambia's hope that the program of action will be implemented in its entirety as it is essential for achieving a peaceful world for all. The UN program of action calls for structures that will help enable governments fight against this menace of small arms and light weapons, and the establishment of national commissions and national focal points uh, was one of the recommendations of the program of action. Many governments have instituted national commissions on small arms and national focal points. Uh, the challenge is that uh, we still don't have sufficient resources to be able to effectively implement the programs that needed to be carried out under the United Nations Program of Action. What is the UNPO? A4. It's really, the aim is really to reduce gun violence in the world. So um, if um, we, we keep on removing substance from the POA, if we keep saying, oh, we should not do that, it's very controversial, then um, are we really then, you know, um, making an impact on the ground, um, you know, um, with, with these reviews that we are making. I f personally feel that the purpose of a review is to strengthen the document, but it seems like for so many states, you know, that's not their purpose. It's really just to review the progress of the implementation. Because, you know, when you review some something and you see that there are gaps, you really have to strengthen the implementation. But there are so many states in there that actually say, well, you know, um, we just really have to strengthen the implementation. So the document that's coming out right now, there's a section on strengthening the implementation of the POA. I don't know what's going to happen on Friday. I hope that there's going to be a consensus on this um, document. But the language is becoming stronger. You know, um, language that before was not acceptable to some, we're now a little bit acceptable to many. As I'm speaking to you now, my commission in Sierra Leone is under extreme pressure to destroy over 6,000 weapons collected 
they were voluntarily surrendered. And we have been under extreme lambasting by the public that these weapons have been delayed because we have something on our sleeve. But when I came here, the, my contact with several potential donor agencies is already there in foot. Now the Mines Advisory Group is already in contact with my country back home, with my commission, so that by the end of this week, two specialists will be leaving Manchester for Sierra Leone to have this 6,000 and more weapons destroyed. That is commendable, and I want to announce here that we are happy that our coming here is bearing practical proof. That is our interest, Sierra Leone and Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. We have the task of finalizing this text, this draft text. The spirit of the draft is to be flexible.
It seems to me that we have rekindled the fire in the Southern agenda. Despite all the challenges we encountered, the long working days, and the late night revisions and consultations, we have kept our eyes on the ball. We did not flinch. We did not give up on ourselves and we doubled down on what we do best, talking our way forward, dialoguing our way forward. In the end, what we have as a reward for our hard work is a harvest time. We should all take pride in the fact that we have completed the task entrusted to us and we have achieved the desired outcome. <coughs> By doing so, we have created a much needed and timely momentum for positive movement in the overall multilateral development process. We have almost come to the end of our deliberations for this conference. Before we close the session, I would like to express personally my profound gratitude to all the Vice Presidents, to the four facilitators. I want to call their performance superhuman, their indefatigable. All the contributions they made to the success are greatly appreciated. In particular, I am greatly indebted for their inestimable support and assistance to me as conference president. Quite frankly, without their support, my task would have been totally difficult. They made it possible for me to take long breaks. I want to thank the civil society groups for their tireless efforts and for the contributions they have made to this conference. Thank you for the momentum that you have helped us to sustain. My special gratitude to the Conference Secretary General and the Conference Secretary, Mr. Daniel Prince, Mr. Sevier Genevisky, Genevisky, for the guidance and the wise counsel we distinctly gave me, not only on procedural issues, but on many substantive issues throughout the conference. Of course, the ultimate decision was mine. Last but not the least, the interpreters who have made it possible for us to communicate, the conference officers and other support staff, most of them working very diligently and in the shadows round the clock to facilitate our deliberations. I want to thank them very much. If I've forgotten to thank anybody, please pardon me. This is all from my heart. For me, this is a learning experience, a huge learning curve, and I'll never have it in my memory. <coughs> and grateful with this very successful outcome and I want to congratulate uh, Nigeria uh, and in particular Ambassador Ogwu for the great uh, leadership uh, she has shown in bringing this important conference to a success. Uh, what we have uh, achieved today, uh, universal consensus for the first time since 10 years on reaffirming the commitment to fight against illicit small arms and light weapons worldwide and particular also in the African continent. That is an achievement which will help 
in particular vulnerable people, societies and communities throughout the world. I was talking to some colleagues who said we have exercised the, the, the evil and then the ghost out of disarmament. The outcome gives enough substance to those member states that are implementing the UNPOA for them to continue forward for the next six years. I want to say that Her Excellency Professor Joy Ogu is a remarkable leader. She is not only a remarkable leader, she is an exemplary African woman with the ability to negotiate, to mediate, and to put her technical skills to work to produce a very fine UN document. Ambassador Ogu has nurtured this process from the very beginning through open, honest, transparent consultation, patience, listening to all delegations, and through a very systematic process of consultation that started out here at the UN headquarters in New York, and saw her travel and engage Geneva, engage the ASEAN region, engage CARICOM, and even engage Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in Nairobi, Nairobi, the capital of my country, Kenya. Her Excellency gave time and thought to the process. She wrote letters to each member state and published her letters. She reviewed expert documents and produced her chair's summary based on the expert input, both from the member states and from reviewed documents. Her Excellency sat through preparatory consultations and negotiations and was able to, even when things were hard, lead us towards adopting a document. She has actually, beyond that, utilized innate wisdom. The wisdom that very few have, the ability to set your ego aside and listen to the voices speaking around you. Indeed, Benazir Bhutto said that peace and peace negotiations would have been better the world over had women taken the lead. Her Excellency Ambassador Ogu is indeed a living example of Benazir Bhutto's vision for international peace and security. We are proud of her and we are proud of this outcome. It helps us look forward towards putting women ahead in terms of negotiating peace and security for the international community. She's a very good diplomat, she's competent in this issue, she's good in negotiation. And until the end, it was really a negotiating process. Her team and also the secretariat and also all the member states there were really Everybody worked hard towards a successful outcome. Africa and the African group at the United Nations uh, give her tremendous support, and then the whole uh, world community at the, at, uh, the United Nations uh, actually supported her. And, uh, but you could also see how she brought experience to bear uh, on the process. Experience to bear in the sense uh, uh, that uh, she, uh, it's like thinking out of the box that, uh, look, I won't do what was done in the past. Yeah. Maybe it was a little bit risky, but at the end of the day, you could see that uh, uh, it paid off.